Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another mystery video where today I want to share with you the story of a Jane Doe known as Tempe Girl. In a bit of a change from your standard Doe case, Tempe Girl's death is not actually technically considered to be a murder, she is simply unidentified which is just as sad. It certainly seems like Tempe Girl had a complicated life and the sort that she definitely had family out there as you'll come to see, they just haven't come forward to claim her yet. Even sadder is the fact that she was young, likely a teenager still. And this is also quite a recent case. A lot of Doe cases I cover tend to be 30, 40, sometimes even 50 years old. But this case was from just 2002 and Tempe Girl's face was found fully recognisable. So there's a very, very high chance that her identity and family can still be found. It was early morning, 5.40am on April 27, 2002, when a body was found behind a strip mall by an employee in Tempe, Arizona. This was at 1850 East University Drive, very, very close to Arizona State University in Maricopa County. Obviously, the authorities were called to the scene and the medical examiner soon confirmed that this girl had been deceased for less than 24 hours when she'd been found. And at autopsy, her cause of death was found to be acute cocaine intoxication, a cocaine overdose. Interestingly, whilst the medical examiner said that she did have a large amount of cocaine in her system, it wasn't exactly an extreme amount. She was found fully clothed and had no obvious wounds or injuries, leading investigators to determine quite early on that she likely wasn't a victim of homicide. Very confusingly, articles from this time, so back in 2002, say that her death couldn't be ruled either way, so it wasn't either a homicide or an accident, but more recent articles say it wasn't a homicide. So I can only assume further changes were made to the ruling at some point over the years, but I couldn't find any article saying when that happened. It was a tragic death, but there was nothing on this girl that gave any clues as to her identity. Thanks to the cause of death and the fact that she was found so quickly, we do actually have an accurate physical description of Jane Doe, or Tempe Girl as the media would soon dub her. She was estimated to be between 15 and 19 years old, female, 5'1 and £125. She had black hair about 12 inches in length, so just past her shoulders, and brown eyes. She's thought to have been Hispanic and or Native American. And in terms of any distinguishing marks or features, she did have a couple of scars. One was approximately one inch long on the back of her hand, extending from just below her pinky and ring finger towards her wrist. And she had another scar on her left shoulder. She also wore faded purple nail polish on her fingernails and was wearing a red tank top, blue jeans with a side zipper and eyelets on the waistband in the brand Watch LA blue underwear and black lower east side brand slip on shoes with a three inch wedge heel in a size six and a half. All of her clothing was from very common brands at the time so that didn't help very much in narrowing things down. She also wore a purple elastic hair tie around her right wrist. I don't know why that detail really sticks out to me. There are like certain things when I research cases that really humanise victims for me, like really bring it home. This was a real person walking, talking, breathing. And a teenage girl wearing a hairband on her wrist. Like that just did something to me. That's something we all do. Like obviously I know that all of the victims I talk about are real. That's like why I do what I do here. But there are certain details that always just hit me out of nowhere. And we all need those small reminders in true crime that these are real people that were loved and had full fulfilling lives. I mean just a hairband on her wrist that like, you can literally see on my wrist the mark where I've had my hair bands overnight. It's just something that's so human. We do have Tempe Girl's dental charts, fingerprints and DNA which has been entered into CODIS but no match has been struck as of yet. With all the advancements in this field though I'm sure it won't be long until they do find something so fingers crossed. Very confusingly, the Wikipedia page for this case does state that earlier this year, so 2022, the DNA Doe Project announced their intention to find Tempe Girl's identity via genealogical research. But I actually couldn't find any record of this on the DNA Doe Project Facebook page or on their website. The only reference I could find was a post from 2018 in which it was said that Tempe Girl had been suggested to them for consideration. I hope that Wikipedia is correct and they are looking into her case. I just couldn't find any confirmation of this on either their pending or active cases pages. 
that is the problem with Wikipedia. If you see something on there, you've got to go back and find the source, check the source, because a lot of the time people can put false information in there. There are post-mortem photos available of Tempe Girl. I won't include them in this video as honestly the reconstructions are very spot on. And I know that most people don't want to see post-mortem photos. Honestly, neither do I. But I will leave them linked down below in case anyone wants to go see her actual face. Now luckily, this isn't all the information we have about this case. Investigators were actually able to piece together the hours before Tempe Girl's death, thanks to a case of CDs that was found close to her body. They had a look at these CDs to see if there were any fingerprints on them, and there were. And these fingerprints were identified as belonging to a woman from Phoenix, Arizona. Investigators went to interview this woman who claimed that these were her CDs and she'd last seen them in her car, but she had no idea who this girl was or about her death. However, this woman's boyfriend had an interesting story to tell. He said that he'd seen this young girl hitchhiking alone near 32nd Street and Greenway Road in Phoenix on April 26th. She waved him down as he drove by the mall. So he picked her up and she asked him to drive her to a nearby store where she initially said that she wanted to buy tickets for a music concert. However, just minutes later, she changed her mind and asked to be driven to another location instead. Now I want to be completely honest here and say that this next bit of information I'm about to share does come from the Wikipedia page, but the source cited for this information is an article on AZ Central, and that article has since been removed or I'm just unable to access it for whatever reason, even with my VPN. I couldn't find this information anywhere else, but there is basically no information about this case online, so we are working with very limited resources here. So this Wikipedia article, it could be wrong. Like I said, you've always got to trace it through to its source, but that source no longer exists, so just take what I'm about to say with a pinch of salt. The Wikipedia article states that Tempe Girl actually asked this man who had picked her up if he knew of a way to get drugs, to which he replied yes and drove her to a second location. At this second location, she met with a male who got into the back seat of the car and sold her cocaine, presumably spending her money on that rather than on the concert tickets. And a few sources all agree that this next thing happened. So apparently a second man got into the back seat of this car and sold Tempe Girl the drugs, which is why I am inclined to believe that the information on Wikipedia is correct and the driver is the one who sourced the drugs for this girl. Otherwise, I can't imagine anyone being happy with or allowing a drug dealer to get into the back seat of their car and let a drug deal happen. This whole situation is very strange. Honestly, I am inclined to believe that this story this man told isn't the whole truth, but it certainly seems like the investigators believed him. Maybe because most people wouldn't admit to being complicit in a drug deal like this one, particularly one that led to a death. The man, the driver, has said that him and the girl spoke in Spanish whilst in the car, and she told him that she'd been recently disowned by her family or kicked out of her family's house because of her drug use and she didn't have anywhere to stay. As far as I could find, she never mentioned whether or not she was local to the area, but most people believe that she probably was. So this drug deal happens and Tempe Girl snorts the cocaine in the back of the car and she starts having seizures. Panicked, the driver took the girl out of the car and told the drug dealer, who was still in the back seat at this point, to call 911 from the nearby gas station and then the driver drove away. Records do show that around this time a phone call came in to 911 from the Circle K gas station, but it was unintelligible and no one was ever dispatched to the scene. It seems like after this point, the drug dealer just fled. You would assume that what the driver did was illegal somewhere along the line here, whether that's driving the girl to the drug dealer, letting the deal happen in the back of his car, abandoning a person in medical need, but it seems like all of his actions here slipped through loopholes in the law. According to an article on CNN, authorities were not able to press any charges because they didn't know if Tempe Girl was a minor or not. If she was a minor, then I would assume that's child endangerment, but because they don't know her age, the driver couldn't be charged with anything. 
They also don't know if she was alive at the time she left the vehicle or not, or if she was pushed or pulled out of the car, if she fell, if she walked out of her own accord. Detective John Thompson of the Tempe Police Department said to CNN, there is a statue for concealment of a dead body, but we don't have anything to say she was deceased at the time he dropped her off. It's very frustrating for everyone involved, but I do see why the police couldn't charge him with anything. He just got lucky with the loopholes here. I found myself wondering why the driver wouldn't at least drive the girl to a hospital and just drop her off outside there. I know that's probably what I would do if I found myself in a situation like this, but I was actually browsing threads about this case on Reddit and found a comment from a user called a Jew Marlene six years ago that just happened to answer this question. They wrote that back in 2002, apparently, you couldn't drop somebody on drugs at a hospital emergency room without ending up arrested yourself for being complicit. Again, I couldn't check this information anywhere. My Googling didn't really come up with any answers to whether this is true or not, but I'm inclined to believe that maybe it is. This is a law that has changed since, but it could explain the panic in this situation. The user also points out that if the driver was used to being around drugs, which is suggested in the fact that he was able to connect the girl with the drug dealer almost instantly, he may have known that seizures happen and aren't always deadly. He might have been desensitised to it and assumed that she was going to be okay. Although he did try and get the drug dealer to call for help, so he didn't completely abandon the situation. I think we've got to remember that right or wrong, these situations do always have a lot of nuance to consider, and you'll never know how you'll act in a situation like this until you're in it. Panic can make people do really stupid things. And that's about where the initial investigation into this case just came to a dead end, and there hasn't been anything to revive it again since. As I said, all her information is available, so fingerprints, dentals, DNA, it's in CODIS, and the National Crime Information Centre. It's just a case of waiting now and spreading the word in the hope of reaching somebody who knew her. Investigators have considered a number of avenues in their search for her identity. They've worked very closely with the Mexican consulate in the chance that Tempe Girl may have come from Mexico and could have been reported missing there, but there's been no luck. Her race has been described as Hispanic and or Native American, but the fact that she did speak fluent Spanish does perhaps mean that she leans more towards being Hispanic, but of course there are Native American people who also speak fluent Spanish as well, so the chance of her being Native shouldn't be ruled out. I have seen people online speculating that she may have gone missing from a Native American reservation and may only have been reported missing to the reservation's authorities, but I don't really know how likely this is. I'm sure in the 20 years since it's happened, a connection probably would have been made. I think it's more likely that Tempe Girl was never reported as missing at all. She said herself that she'd been kicked out or disowned by her family due to her drug use, and if this was the case, it does mean they're less likely to have reported her as missing, at least they wouldn't have done it immediately. If they still haven't heard from her to this day, they've probably either assumed that she did die from the drug use eventually, or that she took their wishes very seriously and has just never contacted them again. There may have been a lot of shame around their decisions, which makes them less likely to come forward. Also, it could well be that Tempe Girl came from an immigrant family. If they were to report her as missing, then that could shine a light on them and could potentially lead to deportation if they immigrated illegally. This could also be why she was kicked out because of drug use. This is speculation, of course, but perhaps a family were worried that it would bring the authorities to their doorstep and again potentially lead to them getting deported. Or it could be much simpler than that and it could just be that her drug use was getting dangerous and her family just didn't know what to do anymore. Being around substance abusers can be really, really hard. Tempe investigators did look into numerous schools in Arizona looking for students who matched Tempe Girl's physical description, but they never had any luck. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children have created a forensic facial reconstruction of her, which is likely very, very true to life as she was found so soon after her death and her face was untouched. Fingers crossed the DNA Doe Project are working on her case or are going to very soon, but in the meantime, if you know of a family who had a teenage girl get kicked out or go missing in the early 2000s and they've never heard from her again, you can contact the Tempe Police or the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, for which I will leave contact details down below. This case is hopefully one that will get sold via genealogical technology, but if her family are immigrants or she was an immigrant from Mexico herself, then it's less likely she will have DNA relatives in the database. 
Not impossible, of course, but more unlikely. This might just need to be one that word is spread about more. She was a teenager who made poor choices, but she deserves her identity. She deserves to be reunited with her family and her family deserves to know what happened. Her facial reconstructions break my heart because she looks so young. She looks like a child. She should have had so much more time ahead of her to get back on the right track. And she just lost it. She didn't have that time. Thank you so much for watching this video. Like I said, any contact details for the authorities will be down below. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.